Okay, so before I get started, I wish to do the usual acknowledgement and acknowledge that uh, I live in the unceded ancestral and traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nation. So today I'm going to talk about a road trip that my wife Edie and I did together with my brother and his wife in the Loire Valley in May of 2022, going from Paris to Orléans and from Orléans through the Loire Valley to Tours. So we, we had just completed the river cruise on the same river that I talked to you uh, about in February. And so we stayed one night in Paris after that before starting out the following morning. And this time I stayed here in this hotel, Hotel Mont Ast Hotel. And you can see it's very close to the Jardin du Palais Royal. And then from there to the Louvre, Jardin de Tuileries and the Place de la Concorde. So I had time uh, in the afternoon and also before breakfast the next morning to do that before starting on a road trip. So I'll just show you that first of all. And just going from our hotel, we had to go through this um, uh, passageway to get to the uh, gardens of the Royal Palace, the Palais Royal. And I thought it was quite a beautiful highlight to just look up and uh, see the symmetry of this uh, pathway between two big buildings. But once we got into the garden, uh, there was this uh, display in the pond uh, by Fabrice Hibert, um, recollecting 30 years of L'Homme de Bessine. And she had created these green men, one of them is in the Louvre, and so on, or, or the Pompidou Center, I should say. And uh, they had this uh, memorial display. And from here, you can walk through these uh, columns and you end up into this foyer, quite beautiful. And finally, further into Palais Royal. And this was built for Cardinal Richelieu in the 1633 to 39. And one of the features in here are these columns, black and white columns created by Daniel Buren, 1985 to 86. Some, there are 260 okay. of these columns and uh, of different heights. And here's another photograph looking back in the slightly different direction. And you can see uh, someone um, here sitting down and then the lady here to get the size of the scale of uh, what is going on here. So you come out from the Palais Royal and very quickly you're at the front of the Louvre and the famous uh, um, paste uh, monument. And from there you turn around and you look up uh, toward uh, the Arc de Triomphe. Here's the real Arc de Triomphe. Place de la Concorde here. And this is called the Arc de Triomphe du Carousel leads into the Tuileries Garden. And it's all one long vista that you can take all the way through um, to the, along the Champs-Élysées. And here, just walking uh, in the Jardin de Tuileries toward the Place de la Concorde and the obelisk that you see here. And some of you will be aware that this particular obelisk, which is in Place de la Concorde, came from right here in the Temple of Luxor in Egypt. There were two of these obelisks, one is still in Luxor and the other one was brought to Paris. And they decided not to bring the second one because it was just too expensive to bring it. So we're going to leave Paris and go by road. And we're going to go from here down to Orléans. And now then we'll be along the, the uh, River Loire and from Orléans to Blois and finally to tour, so a fairly short distance. And as we went from Orléans to tour, we stopped at a number of places, Beaugency, Chambord, Cheverny, Théde en Blois, to Amboise, Chenonceau, and Tours. So these are what you're gonna see. We were very fortunate. I was able to find online a company called Destination Libre. And as the, as the name suggests, 
it allows you to choose where you want to go. And this lady or her partner come in their uh, van and they take you around. And uh, she actually came up from close to Goa, from Loire Valley, which is where they're based. And she overnighted in Paris. So she was there first thing in the morning after breakfast to pick us up and just drive us to our first destination in Orléans. And then she came and picked us up and took us everywhere and stopped where we wanted to stop. It was very nice. And compared to any other tour that I had tried to look at, the price was ridiculously cheap. So the first stop was Orléans. And here we are in the main square in the center of Orléans. And that's a bit of history. The name Orléans, originally this was called Sinabum, when the Gauls were here. And then the Romans came and they called it Aurelianus after the general Aurelian, Aurelian, yes, and that morphed into Orleans. And when you are in Orleans, you look through the O of Orleans, well, you see a, um, a, a person on a horse. And everywhere around this area, person on a horse, a female, will be Joan of Arc. And this is the Joan of Arc the heroine of Orléans. And uh, it says to Joan of Arc, the tongue of uh, Orléans with the agreement of the entire France. So in Orléans, we visited at the uh, Hotel Grosslot, which is the prior city hall. The front of it is here, and you can see Joan of Arc at the front. And here is the back, rear of the uh, um, prior city hall with some interesting kind of sculptures. And you can go inside, it costs nothing to visit inside. And it's very beautiful, beautiful decoration, very uh, opulent looking in this particular room, especially. And as expected, monument to Oral Joan of Arc. And there she is on the left in the picture. And the fireplace is interesting because it depicts, depicts the life of Orléans, or three parts of the life of Orléans, of, sorry, of Joan of Arc, I should say. Joan of Arc was born here in Domremy. He lived in Domremy. It was in the northeast part of France in Lorraine. She was a country girl with standing sheep, and she had this vision that she was going to lead the French army for the king against the English with what became known as the Hundred Years' War. Um, she eventually was given permission by the king to lead the army, and she was victorious in Orléans. And then she had cleared a way for the king to get to Reims, where all French kings were crowned. And so she managed to get the king crowned at that time. So here, one of the main streets uh, in uh, the city, and at one end of the street, you'll see the cathedral. Um, and inside the cathedral, I show a picture on the right, but what do you expect to find on the stained glass windows? The story of Joan of Arc, heroine of Orléans on the left, here she is leading the army to victory, and here she is finally being burnt at the stake with a fire underneath her, and this happened, as I told you a few months ago, in the city of Rouen, next to the old marketplace in Rouen. By contrast, we visited a synagogue, the only synagogue in Orléans, and it's a pretty small place and simple compared to the cathedral, of course. Next door to the synagogue, there is um, a museum dedicated to the children of Valdiv, which I talked about last time. This is the roundup of the Jewish children and mothers that who were uh, were taken to the Velodrome d'Ivé, and then they were sent to internment camps for Jews in Pitivier and bon la roland which is next door to Orléans, which makes sense for them to have a museum in this particular area. So going back to this main street, uh, I like gardening, I like uh, nature, and I thought it was just wonderful what they had done here. Look at this uh, stand for uh, pots of flowers. And they had many of these going all along the street at different intervals. Uh, it was just quite uh, striking. We 
there happened to be a, an exhibition of sculptures by Marcus Lupertz, a German sculptor, who very unusual kinds of sculptures, as you can see here. There are two of them. There are many of them around the, the town when we were there. And as we saw in the Normandy area, we had a lot of these uh, half-timbered houses. Um, I particularly like the one on the left-hand side, in part because the window was open. We had a feeling of being able to look inside the house, not just observe the outside. And the one on the right is uh, on top of a restaurant, Otakos. Some of the uh, um, drainage covers, the sewer covers, quite interesting. They've painted them in different uh, colors and there's some different styles of things. And quite decorative. And this is in the main square of the city. And so then we went on uh, and drive into Beaujolci, which is right on the Loire River. Orléans is also on the Loire River, but uh, the center is not on the river itself. But here, the center of Beaujolci is next door to the river itself. You can see the cathedral here and how close it is to the river. It's a small town. Um, some of the famous things there are the uh, clock tower, Tour de l'Orlogue from the 12th century, and a very strange kind of uh, drain that seems to have um, cobblestone built into the drain itself. I thought that was a little bit different. And we visited the Eglise saint etienne the oldest church in the area from the 11th century, a very small church of some historical significance. And there are a couple of signs that I quite like. The one on the left says Chalon de Blota, um, kittens and little, little devils. And it happens to be a childcare center, signs for a childcare center. And then there was a bookstore that was called the Chat Qui Dort, the, the cat who sleeps. Right now his eyes are wide open, sitting on top of a pile of books, but it was interesting. I like the sign. And uh, there's a um, it's an old tower, it's called Crochet Saint Fermain from the 11th century. And of course, there's a mandatory somebody that we need to mute. And here is the War River with one of the old stone bridges going over the river. A couple of people walking over the bridge. And then we went to a very small town called Vienne, uh, La Pé du Surf, as the, the land of the uh, surf, which is stag. And here's La Maison du Surf, with the sign of the stag on top of it. An interesting uh, design for the climbing roses on the front of this house, and a wine press, uh, uh, definitely one of the parks a little bit of artifacts that they had there. It's not really a museum, maybe an outdoor museum. And then we we're en route to visit the first of the Grand Chateaux that the War Valley is famous for, Chateau de Chambord. I, I wish I could say that I took this photograph, but I didn't, because when we were there, you couldn't see much of this from the outside. It was all covered with scaffolding and cloth and so on under reconstruction. So I had to uh, uh, take this photo as to what it would look like and will look like maybe in a few years when they finally take down all the scaffolding. But right now it's not pretty from the outside. This chateau is the largest chateau in the Loire Valley. It has 426 rooms, 282 fireplaces and 77 staircases. And it was constructed in 1519 to 1547, look at the year when it started, 1519, because we'll come back to that, by King Francis I as a temporary residence and as a hunting lodge. It was too big, too difficult to actually heat this, to hold his court there and have meetings and whatever. His court was held at Chateau de Dambois, a much more a humbler kind of chateau, which we will see a little later. But what he wanted to do was show how wealthy he was and build this edifice to his glory and his wealth. So one of the features of the chateau is this 
double helical staircase, which is around the central column, and it is a supporting structure in the middle of this chateau. Again, this is not my photograph. It's a photo by someone, Sophie Lloyd, who was on the internet, in New York. And there's a lot of discussion about whether this was designed by Leonardo da Vinci, which many people think it was. I actually went inside on the ground floor at the bottom, inside the double helical staircase, inside the central structure, and this is what it looked like looking up toward the, the roof. Quite an impressive central core with the stairway going in a double helix pattern around it. And when you get up to the top, you can go out onto the patio, to the balcony, and look down at these very beautiful formal French gardens, some similar to what you would find uh, in outside Paris. What's the name of the uh, famous garden outside Paris? Versailles. Versailles. Similar to Versailles, thank you. And so a bit of a, more about Chateau de Chambord, our guide that we had told us. At the time, Francis I and Charles V of Spain were vying to be named Holy Roman Emperor after Charles V, father who held that position had died. And Charles V won out. It is said because he had more uh, bribed more people to get more votes, and he finally was elected Holy Roman Emperor. And uh, so Charles V was in, in Spain. He also ruled uh, Belgium, and there was a bit of an uprising in Ghent, and he needed to get from Spain to Belgium and had to move through France. And so Francis said, well, why don't you and your guys come and uh, stop by and stay with me at Chambord? You know, you're passing through France. I offer my hospitality. Most of the time, the two of them were at war, actually physical war, but they were in a period of peace at the time. And Francis used this as an opportunity to show off, basically. And Charles described Chambord as a synthesis of what human industry can achieve. And when he took uh, uh, Charles after dinner, come out onto the deck where you can see the gardens, I took the photograph and look back, you can see the, like a crown, the fleur de lis, the, the importance of Francis being thrown in the face of the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. Just a little uh, aside, down in the main floor, there's a little museum, a carriage museum, where they have a number of royal carriages that were built uh, around 1860 for the Comte de Chambord, with the saddlery was actually created by Hermes, which we all know about now, even nowadays. And they've never been used. So we then went from there, again by road to Bois. It was overcast, with a beautiful view across the, uh, the War River to the town itself. Um, the We'll get to visit this a little bit more in detail shortly. And uh, we went from there the next morning to Chateau de Cheverny. So this is not from the internet. There was no scaffold in here. The chateau was beautiful. Here are the four of us, uh, my wife Edie and I, and my sister-in-law, my brother. And um, we were one of the first people to arrive because we were just staying next door in Blois. And so we left early after breakfast and there was nobody there. So we had a chateau initially to ourselves. This was a wonderful experience. There was a festival of hats, which is what this big hat in the grass is advertising. We didn't go to see the hats. We went inside the chateau. There were rooms that looked like this. It's the dining room set up as though people are about to eat. And you have artifacts uh, like a primitive piano. And on the left-hand side, um, these, this is a metal bin um, that the king would put all of his important papers, the deeds, these properties, and seal them, and would travel with this bin. It was fireproof, but he wouldn't leave them behind. 
So as these kings traveled around the countries, they would take all the valuable papers with them. And that's what that uh, cas uh, cask is. It was a hunting lodge also, and there were hunting dogs, a whole pile of them. They also had a pond and a big park with uh, white swans and black swans. And this garden of love with a number of uh, sculptures uh, by the French Swedish sculptor Gudmar Olofsson. Uh, I like the one on the left particularly, I was a pediatric neurosurgeon and it's called Prelude. And the other one he named the two trees. I'm not quite sure why, but that's what that statue uh, sculpture is called. So in Blois itself, when we went back to Blois after visiting, we got all free time now to just walk around and explore Blois on our own. And this is the Royal Chateau of Blois. Uh, different wings, this is the Louis XII wing. And Louis XII was the King of France before Francis from 1498 to 1515. And all of these kings had uh, their own emblems. There's Louis on his horse, his emblem was a porcupine. So this tells you it's Louis uh, well, and from this royal chateau, you can look across the town, the roof of the town, and you can see the cathedral of Blois on the other hill. And so I walked over to the cathedral, and at the cathedral, uh, on the level below it, there is this huge rose garden, and that's all roses, roses everywhere. And looking down from this here patio, that you can look down. That's what we're looking at. And Joan of Arc. This is actually a new statue. It's a replica of one inaugurated in 1915 on Riverside Drive near the Hudson River in New York. I'm not sure why people in New York decided that they needed a statue of Joan of Arc, but there might be some history to do with that. But it basically says to the glorious Joan of Arc um, and her noble country of the Lorraine and her dear Patry, Father, France, the Republican States, United States, and the city of New York, show the admiration on uh, August of 1921. And when you look down from that uh, area, you look down to the river, across the bridge, to the other side, which is, we had our dinner right in the restaurant behind there, those trees. And when you walk over to the other side, you can look back up to the uh, cathedral. The oldest house in uh, Blois is this particular one, which is a half timbered house also. And I have a photograph for the cyclist among you. I'd not seen this before, but there's a cycle repair depot for you sitting in the middle of this town. You just walk by by the river, and you can stop your bike and they have tools so you help you repair your bike did you need that. And just a view of that evening from the bridge looking back up the War River. And as we walked along the river, there was a lot of bird activity. Here's a moorhen on the left, gull, and we saw a beaver, the beaver. They have beavers in the river. And the little island sitting in the war itself, river itself, and there are piles and piles of gulls and they're nesting. They make a lot of noise, but it's not captured in this video properly. Okay. And here is a weed that's uh, growing in the river. It's called river water crowfoot. And I quite like the contrast between the uh, weeds and the blue of the water, different colors in the water. It's been enhanced a little bit uh, from a somewhat duller version of the actual photograph, but I thought it was quite pretty. And here again, same kind of weed uh, moving around in the water. Well, the next morning, we finally had nice sunshine. And we went back to the same spot to take a photograph in the sunshine the one that we'd taken uh, when we first arrived in Blois when it was all overcast. And you can see the region of the um, 
castle and the cathedral on the other hill with the city in between. So we went uh, next to visit Chateau de Chenonceau. This is the last of the castles that we visited. And this was built between 1513 and 1522. Uh, and it was seized by Francis I uh, from the person for whom it was built um, because they owed the king some money. And they seized this uh, chateau instead. Now, after Francis died in 1547, Henry II, who was married to Catherine de' Medici, gave the chateau as a gift to his mistress, not to his wife, but his mistress, Diane de Poitiers. And in 1555, Diane had a bridge built across the river. So the original chateau was this part. And in 1555, Diane built this bridge across the river. Not the two things above it, just the bridge. It's quite beautiful to look at, as you can see. Here's another view of it. There's an old tower there, one of the first parts of the chateau. There are some bird's nests, there are house martin nests. They have a very royal uh, location to nest. And when you go up top and tour and go outside, you can look down on the garden of Diane de Poitiers. So Diane also created these gardens, a formal garden. She also created an informal garden, vegetable garden, a flower garden behind uh, the main chateau. Well, Henry II died in 1559 from a jousting injury. And Francis II, who was the eldest son of Catherine and Henry, became king when he was 15. Of interest, he was also king consort of Scotland because he was already married to Mary Queen of Scots. Some trivia for you. The first fireworks display in France was held at this chateau during the celebrations marking the ascension to the throne of Francis II. So that would have been in 1559. Well, Henry was dead. Catherine kicked out Diane from the Chateau de Chenonceau and took it over herself, and she commissioned her own garden. There is a garden of Catherine de Medici on the other side of the chateau, that you can see again from the top, looking down built in 1560. And then she said, okay, I'm going to add on top of this bridge that uh, Diane put, and I'm going to make it my structure. So she added these galleries and a grand ballroom on top of Diane's bridge. Well, a little bit of rivalry between the wife and the mistress. Catherine de Medici had this uh, apothecary. It's interesting. You can see all the different herbs and medicines that they used in those days in the 1500s. All beautifully uh, packaged in these containers. And during the First World War from 1914 to 1918, the Chateau de Chenonceau was converted into a military hospital. And the uh, bridge and the structures above the bridge were the wards where the, the soldiers would lie in bed next to each other. And this is, a, they have a little museum part of it, trying to reproduce some of the uh, um, features of the military hospital. Well, Francis II died in Orléans, about a year after on the throne only, from a royal case of otitis media. He had otitis media, just a middle ear infection, got an abscess related to it, couldn't, didn't get it treated, and he died from that. And his doctor was Amboise Paré, a barber surgeon. Now, in those days, men, most of the surgeons were barber surgeons, they were barbers and surgeons, and they used to be with the kings and other people to try, primarily treat war injuries and battle injuries. The physicians thought it was beneath them to do any kind of surgery. So the barbers did most of the surgery. And this Ambroise Paré served as surgeon for the King Henry II, who died in a Justin injury, Francis II, and then his successor, Charles IX and Henry III. 
he is actually a very famous surgical person. He's considered one of the fathers of surgery. And I'm a surgeon. I see there's some other surgeons here. But he was a pioneer in surgical techniques and battlefield medicine, especially in the treatment of wounds. And he invented a number of surgical instruments, including the clamps that we still use nowadays to stop bleeding during surgical procedures. So interesting for me. This is the place where um, Francis II died. Uh, we saw this before in Orléans. So he, was, he died in this building, which is the previous city hall, as I told you. So Charles IX, uh, his, uh, Francis' brother became king. He was only age 10 because Francis was 16. He was the older brother. And Catherine Medici became regent. She had all the power now. So we went next from Chinoso uh, to visit Amboise. Nice uh, small town, smaller than Amboise. And we had lunch uh, sitting at the junction of these two streets. Um, one street goes down toward the clock tower on the right, and the other one takes you past the Chateau d'Amboise. This is where Francis I had his royal court in this particular building, which goes back quite a way. And then we walked up this uh, road and up an incline toward uh, Clo Luce, which I'll show you where Leonardo da Vinci lived. And as we go by, you see these buildings, and many of the buildings are set into cliffs on the side. It's quite soft rock, and it's like caves behind this building. This is a facade, but almost all the building is actually underground. It's uh, in, in the rock. Again, uh, some interesting uh, facades to look at. So we reached Claude Luce. He was brought over to uh, Amboise uh, under the patronage of Francis I from 1516 to 1519. And you will remember that uh, Francis I started to build Chambord in 1519, which is why a lot of people think that maybe Leonardo da Vinci had something to do with the design of the double helical staircase in Chambord. So the statue that you see here is actually not in Cloluce, it's on the side of the river, uh, but in Amboise. And here we are looking at some of the building of Cloluce and looking down from these buildings at another smaller building here. This town is down in this area. This was probably the worst part of my experience. Remember a year ago, we still had COVID with us and COVID precautions, we often took precautions. And so we were wearing masks and we were there the last weekend of May. And I didn't know it, but the last Thursday of May is a religious holiday in France. And just about everybody was out touring. This place was jam packed with people. And I would say that maybe 0.5% of the people were wearing masks. And we're in this building, trying to go around and learn about Leonardo's artifacts, jam-packed like sardines and worried about COVID. So we decided to tell the guide, I know we paid for a tour and everything, but we went out and we left the building and did not see the full, get the full tour. It was just too crowded. So, uh, that particular weekend is not a good one for tourists to go around because the French people are out in force. So this is on the other side of the river where the uh, sculpture of Leonardo was photographed. Looking back at the town of Amboise, you can actually see here the part of the castle that we looked at, but the castle then extends all the way back here. So we finally went to tour our last stop. Um, it comes from a Gallic name called Turon. And then the Romans named it Caesar Odunum in the first century. And finally, it came back to Tour in the fourth century. And Tour actually comprises two separate centers that were linked together as one city only in the 14th century. The oldest center is in the east, which is centered on the Cathedral of Saint Gatien. And the newer one is to the west centered on the Abbey of St. Martin. And right down the middle of the, the city is Rue Nationale. First thing in the morning, 
place. I was there first thing in the morning. It's pretty empty. Doors have not opened yet. And I want you to look at, this is the subway system or the train system that they have there. And here's the train stop. Train comes, stops, and these black and white lines line up. And guess who created that? The same guy who created that. Same person, Burin, designed their metro system with the black and white lines that I just showed you. And I thought that was also interesting. So is this the St. Gautier Cathedral, built in different styles over many different uh, centuries, as you can see here, almost 300 years of building. The front of this uh, neo-Gothic kind of appearance, very spectacular. Walk inside, turn around, look back where you come, and it's just a beautiful set of stained glass windows. Not the easiest thing to photograph because outside is very bright and inside is very dark, but with the magic of editing, photo editing, now you can uh, get this to look okay. Other stained glass windows everywhere, organ. There's some tombs there. More famous is this tomb, Children of Charles VIII and Anne of Brittany from 1506. And then some uh, stained glass depicting the story of Saint Martin, who, as I said, had his abbey on the west side of the city. So Saint Martin, living in 13, 371 to 396, he was a Roman soldier toward the end of the Roman reign. And he met a beggar who was in rags in a cold winter's day. And he took his cloak off and cut it in half and gave half to this beggar. Later, he converted to Christianity and became the Bishop of Tours. And his remains were buried in the crypt of the earliest version of the Basilica at Tours. And this basilica is on the west side of the city and it became a shrine and a place where people started to congregate and create the new tour, as it were. And the only part of that original basilica that exists is this Tour Shaw Magna. And it's called Tour Shaw Magna because this is where Shaw Magna's fourth wife was buried in 800. The remains of St. Martin are still around, but in a building, two buildings away from this particular tower. And if you're interested, which I was not interested in doing it, I didn't have time, uh, you can go on a circuit called the Circuit Saint Martin, and it points out the different sites of importance related to the life of uh, the saint. Just around the corner from here, in, as I said, the newer part of Tour. We have a place that's called Vieux Tour, Old Tour, even though it's newer than the area around St. Gautier Cathedral. And the focal point here is Place Plumereau, which is where a lot of tourists, but a lot of university students like to hang out. There are small streets, there are restaurants everywhere. And we sat outside and had some lunch. And this is also where we sat outside and had dinner at this restaurant had l'atelier gourmand, which for me was the best meal I had in the War Valley. It's closed when I took this photograph the next day because it's not open every day. And I can still taste and see the uh, first course that we had, which was scallops, five scallops sitting on top, little uh, tubes of mushroom risotto. It was just delicious. And so I asked the chef, how do you get the scallops to taste so sweet? He said, secret is just get them very fresh. Why? Next day was Sunday. And we went to a market, went to Sunday market. And we went to Place Velpeau, open air market. There are many of them around. They're, not, they're open on different days of the week, of course. And i uh, show you this picture. And then the next picture, closer up. This lady is buying flowers, and this Sunday, the last Sunday of May in France, is Bon Fête Mama. That's Mother's Day. So Mother's, I had two Mother's Days last year, one in Vancouver before we left, and one in France 
at the last Sunday of May. And the only thing, uh, stores that were doing any thriving business on that Sunday morning were the flower stalls. Busy, busy, busy for Mother's Day. So we went then back to order our hotel, which was close to Hotel de Vila City Hall. And around City Hall at the back, we heard music and we looked and there were these people playing and it looked like they were practicing. We listened for a few minutes and then we left, went along Rue Nacional here, not too busy again, up toward the river here and the bridge that goes off Rue Nacional called Paul Wilson after Woodrow Wilson, the American president. And it was the old stone bridge that was renamed in his honor. And uh, we're looking at the river going, looking east, swirling water underneath at one of the pylons. And we heard music again. So we came back around and when we looked down Rue Nacional, now we saw these people were leading the parade. That's what they were practicing for. So we decided to watch this parade. We met this guy on the right. Looks like he was actually the chief marshal for this parade and he was uh, waiting for this group to arrive, present arms. And he told us uh, he could speak English and he told us this is for the veterans. And the veterans were having a parade with the flags representing different uh, regiments. So in the afternoon, after a quick lunch, we went to visit one of the vineyards for which the Loire Valley is famous. And I learned there for the first time that they, they certainly in the Loire Valley, maybe all of France, they are not allowed to irrigate their vineyards. If it's dry, it's dry. So it, the crop depends totally on the weather, the natural weather. We went into one of the caves. Here is a, a device for shaking the wine around during the processing. Some different vats and barrels underground. And finally, we went back to our hotel, which was opposite City Hall, and it was called Hotel Oceania Universe. An old hotel, somewhat flush, not too expensive actually, but the foyer was spectacular, as you can see here. And then um, uh, Beatrice drove us back, came and picked us up the next morning and took us back to Paris. And uh, we were able to enjoy Paris that afternoon and go out for dinner on uh, Ile de la Ile Saint Louis, have a walk around at sunset and check out from our hotel the next day. And these three things were on the wall at the hotel. I thought they were quite cute. And I photographed the three of them and put them together. The hotel there was called Hotel de Paseo. So thank you very much. I'm going to try to stop sharing, stop sharing, and now we can, uh, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. That was great, Paul. I really enjoyed it. Thanks, Don. Has anybody That's been down the Loire Valley? We have. I've we been. were. Lorna? We were there. We were there many years ago, in 1982. You got to see Chambord before they put all the stuff around it. Yeah, we saw Chambord, and uh, our favorite was was Chenon So because of the, the, the construction the across the river and, and its interesting history. Well, I'm sorry, I'm sorry that uh, um, Richard um, and Helen Spencer are not here. I don't see them because I went to the Loire Valley because of Helen. I was telling Helen I was going to go on this cruise and I wanted to spend a week somewhere that was close to Paris and, and just putter around, not travel long distances. And she strongly recommended we went to the Loire Valley. So I ended up saying, okay, let's look, that, look at that. I hadn't even thought about where I was going to go. And it worked out beautifully. Hey, Paul, uh, what kind of camera did you use? The photos are fantastic. Uh, most of the photos are taken with my Nikon D5500, um, which is a relatively, it is a non-professional Nikon uh, DSLR. 
And I have one lens which costs more than a camera, and that is a Nikon 18 to 300 millimeter zoom lens. So I never take that lens off that camera. Uh, and in addition, I had an iPhone 8, which was uh, also used for many of the photographs. So it was a combination of two cameras that I used. Okay. So while we're waiting, in case anybody else has anything to ask, well, yeah, I'll just well, say, yep, Don. I just have a question. A lot of the buildings you took were you're reasonably close to very tall buildings, you know, spires and, and towers and that sort of stuff. Did you have to do a lot of straightening in Photoshop? Yes. I I don't use Photoshop for straightening. I just use Lightroom. Lightroom, I meant, yeah. And Lightroom is very fast to straighten you know, uh, verticals and horizontals at the same time, actually. It takes the straight. If you don't have the photograph taken well enough uh, and leave a lot of room to crop, you will end up uh, creating something that doesn't look believable. But you still have to try and take it as square as possible. So you have a little straightening to do. But it, you can you can straighten and fairly quick quickly. Any other people? No. Okay. So just to give you an update about um, our next meeting, it's going to be uh, given by Barbara Bernhardt. I see that she is here. I saw her earlier. Barbara, are you here still? Yes. And do you recall the exact date? It's in the uh, travels. Let me see. I'm not sure, actually. I'm going to have it here. You were talking on June the 15th. I thought it was. Yeah. And it's not just me. Joe, Joe Stenberger, my husband, will be sharing the. Excellent. Okay, and she's talking on Slovenia a land of resilience. So I don't think we've ever heard about uh, trips to Slovenia, so we're looking forward to that. Excellent. Thank you. Are there any other comments before we close the meeting? Questions? Oh, Some things in the chat. Let me look at the chat. Okay. How much time did you spend on this tour? This tour took one week, um, I guess uh, probably six nights, one night in Orléans, two nights in Blois, and two nights in Tours, so five nights in hotels. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was an easy trip because the distances were not long. The longest driving was from Paris to Orléans, and that was two hours. And then it was one hour between Tours and Orléans. So when we were coming back, it was a three hour drive to get back to Paris. Um, but we were not interested in long distances and the pleasure of having somebody uh, uh, drive is that you don't have to concentrate on anything. You can ask the lady, stop, I want to get out and take a photograph. Or can we go here? Or can, we go, can we go back to this place that we were yesterday? And it worked out very well. And I said, um, this particular lady and her company were extremely reasonable. And so reasonable that my brother, um, who was with us, he is uh, right now with this lady going from Paris to Normandy um, with two, his daughter and her husband. So four of them in her van, they're going to Rua, going down to Normandy, trying to do the same thing that I showed you on the, along the Seine, but not on a river cruise. But she will drive up from the Loire Valley. She will even overnight in Paris, so she can be there first thing in the morning to start your trip. So did she go back to Paris each night, or or did she stay? No, no she she lives she lives close to that town we showed Vienne. Uh, which was uh, uh, in the War Valley. It's fairly close to Bois. That's where she actually lives. She went by her house and showed us where she lived on the tour. And she 
Well, she drove to Paris, which would have taken her about two hours, 20 minutes, two and a half hours. She stayed in a hotel at her expense, not at our expense, the first night. She picked us up in the morning. She drove us to Orléans. She drove through the town of Orléans to orient us a little bit. Then she left us at our hotel in Orléans. She left. She came back the next morning. So she would have gone home, which is only a half an hour drive. Came back the next morning, started taking us to Vienne and Beaugency. And then she took us to Chambord. And she recommends, she's not a tour guide. She drives. She knows some things. She speaks English fairly well. But she recommended that we hire a tour guide. And she recommended a tour guide. We hired a tour guide in advance. And again, I have a certain interest. I like photography. Uh, I don't personally like looking at dead artifacts, artifact, artifact after artifact in a museum kind of chateau. And I warned the guy before I went there that I didn't want to spend a lot of time doing that. I wasn't going to learn about the names of every king of France and all of this stuff. That was not something that I was going to learn about and remember. So I just assumed she took me to vantage points where she thought I would get good photographs, uh, see some of the things, important history. And she made it very, very entertaining with stories, like the, the, the stories that she talked about, Diane de Poitiers and the and versus Catherine de Bici. They were very interesting to talk to hear her talk about them. She was a licensed guide. And she also arranged the tickets in advance. So when we were dropped off, she was there waiting with our tickets to enter. So we didn't wait in line to get any tickets. That sounds wonderful. Thank you. It worked out well. Thank you. Peter, did you have a question? I see your... Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thanks so much for sharing your, your trip, Paul. I'm just curious, uh, aside from the scallops, uh, did you have any other memorable uh, foods or wines? Uh, that area is, is known for some good, good food and wine. Just curious. I had a lot of good food. Um, I don't like their wines as much as I like wines from other parts of France. Their white wines were okay. Um, didn't think as much of the red wines, and I prefer red wines to white wines personally, by and large. But I, I would say of all the meals that we had, even though we had good meals everywhere, because I had made arrangements in advance to stay, to, to have dinners, not lunches, but only dinners, every night was all booked up in advance at restaurants that were highly regarded based on the reviews on the internet. And again, Beatrice uh, was able to phone the restaurants for us in advance and make the reservations. And when one of them turned out to uh, have closed for two weeks at that time for vacation, she recommended a couple of other restaurants and she made a booking for us. So, but that meal I specifically remember, it's so vivid. The others, not as uh, impressive. The only other one that really impressed me was a place in Paris before we went to the uh, Loire Valley. Um, that was a place known for caviar, which I don't like, but uh, it had a fixed menu that had caviar as one of the courses, and it was the most delicious thing that I'd had. So I changed my mind about whether caviar is something I should eat again, but normally I don't like it. Okay, so I think uh, unless there's uh, any other comments, questions, people want to chit chat, um, I will close the meeting. So thank you for joining me. I know it's beautiful outside and it's tempting to go out there and enjoy your walking. So thanks everybody. And we'll thank see you. you in June. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Paul. It's great. Thank uh, you. Thank you very much. Thank you.